welcome everybody. I hope you're really enjoying the Game Changer Camp so far. Um, I'm so happy to be with you today and I'm looking forward to this talk and our workshop together. So we've all seen this slide, so I'm gonna skip ahead and talk a little bit about what we're gonna do over the next 90 minutes together. Um, so first we're gonna do some brief introductions um, through the magic of technology and Noemi's hard work, we've got a few Mentimeter polls to help us get to know each other a little bit better. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. And once we finish that, um, we're going to walk through a model I've developed to look at and analyze online messaging. And that model is IDEA. It's an acronym. And I'll go through that in a few minutes. Then we're going to look at visual rhetoric and how pictures make arguments. Since that is such a deep component of online campaigns and online messaging, um, it's really important to understand that we already sort of know how to analyze them. And we're just gonna give you some language and ways of thinking about what arguments are saying to us or what pictures are saying to us rather. And I'll walk you through an individual meme example so that we can get into the hands-on part of our workshop which is analyzing a set of memes. And it's a really interesting set of memes from probably the first ever viral network harassment campaign, uh, Gamergate, if you've ever heard of it. So I'm really looking forward to getting started with that. And we'll finish up just with a little bit of group discussion, answering questions, going through anything you're interested in. So I'm so happy that you're here and let's jump in. Uh, Noemi, if you could put up the first poll. <clears throat> well, hello, I'm Ashley Mathias. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Communication at UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina in the United States. All right. Yes, the poll is here. I will put the link on the chat. So what's your job? Please just hit on the link in the chat and uh, open this in a separate bar, separate uh, tab, and please uh, answer your questions. Great, thank you. I'm so excited to see where everybody's coming from. Um, I study communication from the perspective of media studies, cultural studies, and rhetorical criticism. So I think about how media work, how platforms work, what the infrastructure does. I think about its cultural impacts, including political, economic, um, and social impacts. And I think about how media persuades. So rhetoric is about how arguments work to convince people in many ways. Excellent. So we have Poland, Slovenia, Romania, Greece, Excellent. And uh, Ashley, you can double click on the screen to make it bigger. And this is also a tip for everybody. So you, we can play with the screens to, to see some details. Thank you. You're noticing me trying to see with my not quite fully awake eyes yet. Italy, Georgia, wonderful. Bosnia, Herzegovina, fabulous. Well, welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be spending this time with you from all the way over in the US. Um, my work in online communication focuses on gender and identity. So thinking about how discourses in media help us solidify identity through gender and how that's used to make um, campaigns and messaging in online contexts. A lot of that work focuses on groups like the far right, the alt right, uh, groups from the manosphere. So those are the types of areas I study. Can we put up the second poll, Noemi? Yes, sure. Thank you. Now we're gonna see a little bit about where we're all coming from in terms of our organizational topics. So this poll is intended to find out a little bit more about what you're doing. So again, please uh, click the link I put on the chat and answer the question. Social change, digital transformation, wow. Yeah, these are really interesting areas. I'm, I'm reading emancipation, mobilizing others towards action, fabulous, education, good governance, engaging youth. Um, this is so wonderful. One of my favorite things about the Game Changer Camp is its focus on youth engagement. So I'm super excited to have that as part of um, the focus for so many groups. 
So in the first section of telling better stories, we're going to talk about this idea model I've created and how we can analyze online messaging and thinking about if we're going to create our own campaign or even thinking about campaigns we might want to counter message or work against. So this can help us analyze any type of messaging in reality, but it's particularly useful in online contexts. So we tend to think of communication as a way of transmitting information, right? We think of a message like there's a sender, I'm a sender, I'm sending my message to you, transmitting that information to you, my receiver. And if you hear the message well and everything works, you'll understand the information I'm telling you. That's a very old model of understanding communication that came out of telecommunications research in the 1950s. And for that purpose, it works great. Um, but communication studies and studies of how people communicate in different environments have moved a long way from there. So to start in terms of online messaging, we're going to look at a kind of cultural view of messages. So. Cultural understandings of the function of communication are looking at this as information is not the primary goal, right? Facts, data, sure, they're great, but that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose of communication is meaning making and shared meaning making. This means messages convey values, norms, and belief, right? We're, we're telling each other about ourselves and creating group cohesion and thinking through how we can share um, who we are together in a community. So the content is used to reinforce desired cultural meaning, right? So there's still informational content, but that's used more to re reinforce, right, a shared meaning rather than just relay facts. And from this kind of cultural orientation, we can see that there's other things we need to consider besides what exactly is the specific content data, right? Um, so in order to analyze this, I've developed the IDEA model, which IDEA stands for ideologies, discourses, effects, attachments. And these four areas make up, right, the kind of cultural frame of a message or a messaging campaign. Right, a campaign would just kind of extend out the individual message into a broader scope of discussion. So as we kind of think about these components, I'll go through each one in detail with examples, we can kind of see ways we could pull apart or think about how to both understand messages and build new messages. Ideologies. Um, in this sense, they're broader than simply political ideologies, although those are included. Ideologies are something everybody has. They're ways of incorporating new stimuli and matching that up to our worldview, right? So they, they help us formulate the right answer to a new stimulus. They orient us toward or away from identification and action. So our ideologies help us decide what we're gonna do when we encounter a new message or a new phenomenon. Whether or not we agree with it, identify with it as part of who we are, and whether we should do something about it. And we might decide we should do something about it because we don't agree with it, which is a pretty prevalent um, occurrence in online space. Ideologies are not our belief systems, right? Instead, they act as a mediating layer between our belief system and the world, if that makes sense. Um, and it's important to think about belief systems and ideologies as, as interactive in a way that produces schemas or um, mechanisms through which we act in the world, right? And action here, I mean, physical action, like doing stuff, but also um, agreement, disagreement, and identification. Um, an example of this, we could look at sort of different economics um, belief systems. Our belief system around economy and money might be that it is to serve people, or it might be that it's a function of wealth building and industry, innovation, right? Those are different belief systems around economies. For either one of those views, there's several different types of ideologies we could have. Um, one that's very prevalent in the US is a capitalist ideology. Um, and that could work both as a function of believing economies support innovation and industry, and it can also work in 
a belief system that believes economies should serve people, right? We've had the rise of something called compassionate capitalism here in the US. Um, and that is a, a framework that attends to concerns over people and poverty in theory, but it, it doesn't veer into something like socialism or communism as an ideological perspective. And please feel free at any point to ask questions in the in the comments if you have questions about any of the slides. I'm happy to try and answer them as we go along. This course is the second component um, in this frame are more than just talking, right? Discourses include all types of media. They are, as I tell my students, stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And I mean this at a kind of community, a very collective level. So they might be national stories, um, discourses of American meritocracy or American success are a national story about who we are as Americans. Um, they might be kind of group or community-based stories about ourselves, but those discourses are engaged in helping us shape our narratives of who we are and who we are not. They include images, text, videos, all communicative forms help shape and forward discourses or contest other discourses. They are historically contingent. They change over time. One of the ways we can tell things are going on with discourses is how they're impacted by events and temporalities. So in this kind of case, we could think about how sort of ideal constructions of democracy have changed over time would be an example. They help us construct socio-cultural ideals. So they help us with the formation of norms and expectations. Ideals are a way that we kind of shape what we should be, and then we try to enact those, if that makes sense. And my example for this is actually what I study, one of the things I study, which is discourses of motherhood. Um, in the US context, there is a very specific sort of ideal around motherhood in different time periods. So it's very easy to see how the discourse around that has changed or stayed the same. Um, in the early years, 17 or 1800s, the ideal mother was supposed to be pure and chaste and submissive to male authority, as well as predominantly in the home. Um, and while this was not accessible to many women in the United States who are mothers, that was the ideal. The contemporary ideal, today's ideal, has changed. Um, and that has to do with the need for women in the workforce and the shift to uh, women's equality through the feminist movement. So now the ideal still includes things like uh, virtuousness, right? Being a good mother includes that. But the kind of ideas and discourses around domesticity have changed to a certain extent. So women, instead of being domestically in the home, right, their domesticity is now shaped through putting their children first. Right, so that is how they are domestic. So that even if they're in the workforce, home is the first thing that they think about and that is for, shaped through their attention to their children. Um, and that kind of model is called intensive mothering. Ashley, mm -hmm. uh, can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, about this ideology, because you um, uh, gave us an example of um, capitalism as an ideology mm -hmm. and you added this uh, compassionate, Mm -hmm. ideology uh, what can be the example how to understand it so understand cap uh compassionate capitalism yes yes this okay. this so this was an idea that um compassionate capitalism pushes against the notion of industry for industry's sake and the bottom line and it looks toward things like volunteerism and charity and funneling money that's made through capitalist industry into people-centered um, projects, essentially. Oh, right? okay. Capitalism okay. can also be caring about people and communities. It's just not being funneled through the government per se, is the general ideological okay. space. Okay. Right? Thank you for clarification. With this course, it's the example of motherhood. It's it's clear for me, but with this uh, ideology in Europe, we have um, you know different uh, um, trends <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, so so it was new for me. Thank you. 
No problem. I mean, ideologies can be as simple like I work from a feminist lens. That is an ideology. Being a scientist, right? Um, believing in climate change or believing in science, right, is an ideological frame, if that makes sense. So we're looking at a kind of broad scope of of what ideologies are. They're that sort of thing that tells us how we should react to stuff that is coming up in our experience. So discourses also produce um, ways of enforcing norms and contesting norms, right? And we see this in social movements as people provide different sets of engagements. So uh, climate change is actually a pretty good example of that. We have very clear discourses that state that we are in climate crisis and what we need to do to fix that. And we have very clear discourses coming from uh, people who don't believe in climate change about how that is not realistic, if that makes sense. So they, they produce a, a mechanism through which we establish norms and can kind of contest um, those established norms. All right. The next area is effects. So as a component, it's pretty straightforward um, compared to the other ones. Here, we're understanding messages as intentional or having a purpose. They're generated with the hope or intent to produce some sort of outcome. And outcomes may include um, agreement or disagreement, right? And agreement and disagreement are actions in an online context. That's really important to understand. So um, agreement or disagreement can lead to sharing, can lead to telling other people, can lead to a lot of things. Um, they may include specific actions that someone should take, right? Um, you might want to sign a petition or go out and do something in the world with this new information. Um, and they may be aimed at belief system change or behavioral change as well. Um, a good example of that would be public health messaging around COVID actually is, is aimed at behavioral change. So wear masks, wash our hands, social distance. That's the intent of, of public health messaging around um, the virus. And a pretty good example of this that we're all used to is marketing and advertising, right? It's pretty clear cut. The intention there is either to get people to buy products or identify with a brand. Um, so messaging effects, we can think about it in that way. We're trying to persuade people. Um, importantly, some messages succeed and some fail. So it's important to kind of think about why that might happen, why they work for some people and not for others, right? And that connects us back to things like ideology and discourse. But it also connects us to the idea of the next area, which is attachment. So understanding attachments or thinking about attachments helps us understand why people might completely disregard statistics or data um, in favor of a message that they agree with or that feels right to them. And that's a good way to think about attachments. It's how a message connects to our feelings rather than our logical reasoning. Um, here we might wanna actually think about does a message make us happy or sad, right? Traditional marketing is looking for something that makes you connect in a positive, feel good kind of way. But online messaging is a little trickier because it actually can be very productive when you disagree or really don't like a message. Um, that sort of anger factor can sometimes really get us to bypass our critical thinking and share things um, with our social groups. So what this attachment does is it activates our identification or disidentification with a message. So we might share it because we agree with it and it seems to fit who we are, and we might share it because we just can't believe anyone would say such a thing or do such a thing, right? <clears throat> Attachments derive from our beliefs, ideology, and experiences. So by understanding kind of the ideological scope and the discourses and potential effects of a message, we can get into attachments and vice versa. If the attachments are very clear, we can then backtrack into the other three. And so this is a, that we've become more and more used to both in online and advertising or consumption context. So we're very well primed to respond to messaging 
with our emotions. So that is one of the reasons it's so successful. All right. I know we're going through quite a bit, but I wanted to kind of do an example of all four components um, in a topic. I know I'm doing US-based topics, but I also figured um, because people might have questions about them, we could use them to pick things apart a little bit if we needed to. So US race relations tend to be a little murky to people outside of this context. So I thought it might be a good way to pick apart the kind of four components, just like you might run into a media campaign that is um, less known to you. So what is ideology in terms of slavery and US race relations? And we might jump initially to something like white supremacy, but I'm actually gonna argue that the ideology is racism or that's one of the possible ideologies and that the belief system is white supremacy. Um, and the reason I'm saying that racism is the ideology is it is the right answer machine for a white supremacist belief system, right? Racism works around a belief system in race. We have other options for ideology there, something like color blindness in the United States, the idea that we don't see race. And so that predicates how we interact with or forward messaging. But racism is one of the primary ideologies around white supremacy that undergirds US race relations. Discourses. So race itself is a discourse, right? And it includes a lot of different framings, but we could think about scientific frames from eugenics to personalized medicine that is looking at genetic code to kind of identify individual factors. Race gets embedded even at the cellular level in those discourses. It includes stereotypes about racial norms or values and capacities, even aesthetics, right? We have discourses about black hair and white hair and the sound of voices, right? What people's uh, features should look like. These are aesthetic ways of knowing race and discussing race. And they also include policies and laws targeted at racial stratification. Um, this would be legal frameworks for what we call welfare here, um, government assistance, or discussions of poverty and crime, and who are the specific targets of policies and laws. Um, and sometimes they're embedded into practices, which we'll talk with um, about with effects. So, the effects of these discourses and ideology are real and material. We saw them most clearly under Jim Crow, where they were very obvious, right? Where we would have signs that say whites only or colored entrance, right? Um, those were very obvious, but it's become more subtle in the contemporary moment. So we might see practices like redlining, or if we take a look at the demographics around um, who's in US prisons, we see a racialized code of criminality there. So there are serious effects, material effects in people's lives based on how messaging and discourses and ideology work together. And the attachments around this um, are the feelings that undergird kind of this framework, are fears of a loss of power and status. And those are embedded into concerns. You'll hear terms like traditional American values or Southern heritage. Um, here, that's been very prevalent around Confederate statue removal. And I know that there have been some statue removal issues in parts of Europe recently. Um, but this idea of heritage is an attachment to an unmarked white nostalgia, for lack of a better term. So this sort of mythic past when this wasn't an issue, when you know everything was normal is sort of a language you would hear. And it's that unmarked whiteness, right? We, we talk about black heritage or Hispanic history, but we don't ever say white history or white norms. We just say in our context, US history or American history, right? And so that is a way that people are attached to these ideas of white supremacy without necessarily even realizing it. So messaging around that attachment can be very productive. Okay. So I know that this first section is a lot of information. So I wanted to kind of briefly stop and um, 
take a minute for questions or to kind of go back and see how people are thinking about the idea format. Um, so please feel free to type in any sort of questions you might have. And I will take a pause for a beat. So yes, discourse is definitely produced and used by political actors, um, politicians, as well as certainly in the US, we have think tanks that work very hard to produce different sort of discursive messaging to see what will work um, successfully with voting populations. So yes, discourse can be produced by them. So are there questions that I ask myself to help uncover the answers? And yes, so one of the first kind of questions I might ask is who benefits? Who is the beneficiary of this claim, right? What are the implications of this discourse and for whom? Um, and with practice, you can kind of get quicker. If you're working on specific messaging campaigns, it'll become kind of clearer because there will be repetitive types of discourse. Um, so one answer or one kind of discussion that we have going on that hits online context is the free speech debate. So who is silencing whom and how does cancel culture work? And there's a repetitive series of discourses that get leveraged for that. So if you were looking at free speech messaging or you were looking at cancel culture messaging, you would get used to the series of discourse that are occurring over time. No problem, Fernanda. Are there any other kinds of questions? Is everyone okay for me to move on? So our next section is on visual communication. And this is thinking about how pictures and images um, and even film make arguments and persuade us. Okay. So thinking about what is a visual argument, right? We're thinking about how do memes or videos or pictures attached to text work and what do we see in them? And it's really important to note that we've all been trained by prior media, television, film, we've all been trained to be able to understand visual messages. We just don't often have the language to talk about it. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of that language in the next section. So thinking about visual arguments, we're reflecting on what we see and how it's like set up and how we react to it. Okay. Importantly, visuals can convey courses very effectively in a very complex and nuanced way that a single line or a couple lines of text would not. So like the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, or I would say at least two or three discourses, right? So it's important to look at them and think about why an image is being used, why you might be using a particular image. Why does that image represent things to you? Or why should it represent things to others? So to break this down a little bit, we're going to look at what are the components of visual argument. First, we would have image composition. This is the positions of people or objects or symbols in a picture, right? There's, there's rules about where those should go to make a good picture. If you've ever seen um, a how-to for taking good selfies, that has a lot to do with image composition. It also includes lighting and color, and it includes kind of the overall feeling a picture would give us. And that's a response to the choices about where things are located and saturation and hues and things. The second component is discourses and context. So what are the ideas or narratives, the norms that are embedded in the image? What is the stance of the image? How does it work in context, i.e. if it's a meme and there's text involved, what is the relationship between that image and that text? Do they go together? Are they juxtaposed? Is it supposed to be ironic? Um, if it's a post or an image that was shared by someone in our community, um, someone that we know and trust, we're gonna have a different relationship to that image based on whatever commentary they've attached to it. So that would be an example of kind of wider context. And the last component is viewer response and reaction. And so this would be kind of our reaction compared to the things in the context and the composition. Um, so 
as we're kind of looking at an image, we, we natively kind of look at all these things. We just don't necessarily formulate that into an analysis on an everyday set uh, scale. So to understand how this works, I'm gonna show you, well, we're missing a meme here. So, um, sorry, Anna. sorry about that. I have, uh, we'll do the meme in a second. We'll go through the images first. So I can show you three images that are all related to a specific kind of theme. And we're going to kind of look at the images first. They all came from news articles. We'll look at the headlines after we've made a decision about the images and what we see in them to see if that headline, if that text changes our view of the image and what the theme of the images would be. So as we're kind of looking at these pictures, um, feel free to pop information into the chat about what do you see? How does it make you feel? What is the discourse? Like, what does it make you think of? That's a good way to think about discourses and images. This reminds me of X, or I think of this type of thing. That's a way to get at the discourse. So let's do our first image. And we can take a little a minute or two with these. So what do we see in the image? Just really simply, what do you, what do you see? Makes you think of immigration. Excellent. What makes you think of immigration, Susanna? Environmental disaster. Very interesting. Immigration. Stories about the Statue of Liberty. Okay, we've identified the symbol or a symbol in the picture. Right. Point where immigrants landed. Excellent. So some of what we see is going to be contextual as well to where we are and, and our experience. Immigrants arriving. So we, we've, Deborah's given us, uh, based on the way we're seeing the image, based on the composition of the image, I think about immigrants arriving to New York City as well. So that's an important factor. If we were looking from the other direction, we might see the image a little bit differently. But what about what's going on around the Statue of Liberty? What, what is the kind of temperature of the picture? What is the lighting like, right? It's sort of a warm, golden kind of light. It's maybe sunrise or sunset. The water in front of the statue is still. It's sentimental, very good. We see industry in the background, right? Powerful industry, exactly. So as someone from the US, I also load this with my narratives and values, right? I see freedom, I see liberty, I see the idea of American prosperity once you've entered that arena, right? So based on our relationship to a symbol, we might see different things in the image or different things might be more prevalent for us. But excellent job at checking out what's in that image. The next image, is this and again we think about what do we see what does it make us feel what does it make us think about so as you're kind of working into chat about that i will note that the background and foreground in this image are blurred and as a compositional tool that is directing our focus to the clear part of the image right so we're supposed to be looking at what is in focus Can't help but think about police brutality. Okay, so this is a contextual kind of moment around what is going on and has been going on with Black Lives Matter. Um, we have integration of white cop and black cop. Feel concerned and curious at the same time. So I think this one will be interesting when we get to the headline. Dangers of New York City, gang life, drugs, uselessness. So as we're thinking about kind of dangers, oh, Christmas, that's very interesting. So these police officers are kind of just standing on the street with their hands in their pockets. They don't look alarmed. There's no police lines, right? Kind of what I see in it is in sort of everyday people. The police are part of the everyday people of New York City on the street. We're also seeing this from a first person perspective. The camera is our eyes. So we're meant to be feel like we're involved in this moment. We're meant to feel like we're part of the moment. So 
We're meant to relate to them. <laughs> Excellent. One black cop step behind seems evocative. Excellent. So these are great. You're, you guys are really getting in there. So let's do our third image so that we can then get to the headlines and see how that impacts what we, we think. All right, here's a third image. Where are we in this image? What are we doing? You guys are making me chuckle. So bankruptcy, okay. What else is going on? Looks like a metro. You are correct, it is the New York City subway. So this is someone riding on a train in the New York City subway. Okay, so this may be a little more contextual, but we see we're inside a train looking out at the station. There's graffiti, the light reflection is showing us graffiti on the window of the train. The walls of the train are pretty grimy. The sense that I get out of this is that I don't really want to be there. Like staying on the train is bad, getting off the train is bad, right? It's not really very inviting overall. It's not a, a happy story, certainly, about New York from this picture. Does that make sense for everyone that that's what the image is showing us? Okay. So now let's look at the headlines, go with these images. So our first picture, give your reminder since it's been a second, the Statue of Liberty and her golden hues, the headline, New York's beautiful day as 24 hours pass without a single violent crime. So those are the words attached to that image. And that was November, 2012. So we get this warm, prosperous, hopeful kind of picture around the idea of no crime. So the discourse there is about the good life, is about how good life can be with no crime. There's several other ones going on, right? But we get this sense of, opportunity tied to the idea of beauty without crime. Second headline, our police officers, is how crime rates in New York City reached record lows. So how does that jive with what we were thinking about in terms of image two? I think that's got a really strong contextual difference, right? So this headline was 2017, so before the current wave of BLM protests, right? Those everyday cops hanging out on the street have done their job and now they're taking a break, right? That becomes the context with the headline. And the third headline for our subway station, subway train, is New York tackled subway crime. But it's starting, but is it starting to come back? Question mark. And that's from 2019. So that image is meant with the text to make us feel a certain sense of precarity about the situation going on with crime in New York. How do people think about, and feel free to message in the chat, what do you think about the images now with the texts, the headlines? Does it change your view? So on the three, they try to tie to poverty or crime. Yes, the, the primary theme running through them is crime. Um, that's the primary discourse. And then we get other subsequent discourses blended in to help flesh out each story, right? So we have discourses of um, success and prosperity of the first image tied to the larger discourse of crime through its absence, right? When crime goes away, we're all happier. In the second image, right, we get uh, discourses of safety through kind of everydayness. Right when there's no crime, we can all just be together on the streets of New York. Um, and in the third image, we kind of get a crime is on the rise again, and nobody wants to be here for that. Right sensibility about the image. It's also tied to discourses of kind of poverty and crime that are related to dirt and uncleanliness in that third image. Yes, it does. The, the question mark invites readers to have an opinion, right, rather than um, kind of suggesting a complete answer already.
interesting. So for picture one, it was a very kind of negative presentation before the headline, and the headline made it less so, I'm imagining. And then picture two and three, kind of the feeling doesn't really change. Okay. So um, if, the, if the kind of relationship is negative to immigration, right, there are discourses in multiple contexts that might shape that relationship, right? So if the first image was negative, we could think about why, why is my relationship to this or why did I respond to it in the negative prior to the headline? And that would be a question you could ask yourself around an image like you could actually disarticulate them and look at them separately to see why a picture works a certain way with text and without, if that makes sense in terms of analysis to everyone. Do we have other thoughts before I move on to the next short section? Any questions? Okay. I'm gonna keep plowing along because I wanna make sure we have time to do discussion at the end. So if you want to contribute anything else, please feel free to jump into the comments at any point. So we're going to go through a single meme before we do the meme set. I'm going to walk you through um, a pretty common meme um, to get us kind of ready to go for the really hands-on portion where you can jump in using the speaker and your images and we'll um, talk face-to-face -face a little bit. So just briefly, meme culture. Um, the term meme comes from a geneticist named Richard Dawkins, and he starts talking about memes back in the 70s. Um, and he's trying to describe how a small unit of culture gets transmitted from person to person through our kind of collective social body, like a virus, right? It replicates from person to person. He's trying to talk about culture through that kind of metaphor. Um, while memes are not solely part of online environments, we have, you know, think about a really good sales tagline um, that people share. They are really heavily involved in online context and interactions. They're a staple of those interactions. So we tend to think of the meme as the kind of ubiquitous still image with a text written onto it of some variety that's meant to make us laugh or be ironic. But memes can also include short videos. Um, one of the things we've seen, particularly with kind of extremist events, is people will take clips from different sort of extremist videos and meme them or memeify them by overlaying other kind of images on them. Um, the important kind of aspect is that shared between a community of people and spread between a community of people. And from a rhetorical perspective, they persuade because they program us how to react. So because we're used to reacting to memes as humorous or ironic, right, we will, we have learned how to respond to sometimes very problematic ideas through humor and irony um, in meme culture. And this has become so effective and such a part of shared online culture that there are apps and online based meme generators so like if your grandma who is tech illiterate wants to she can go onto a quick little app and make a meme and go viral right potentially <clears throat> and so that tells us a lot about the broadness and the kind of um ability of memes to spread cultural ideas to groups beyond our own okay so one example of this is a very viral meme called the distracted boyfriend meme and does anyone know the meme i'm talking about before i show it to you okay so we have at least one awesome yay two good so here's a version of the distracted boyfriend meme and this is the one that i want to talk about a little bit yay I love memes too. They're they're an endless source of, of interest. So here we have the distracted boyfriend meme. Um, and the text says me looking at the new meme of the guy staring at a different girl while walking with his girlfriend 
and the old memes are looking just horrified, right? So that's this version of this meme. So how might we analyze that thinking about um, idea, ideologies, discourses, effects, and attachments, and also composition and context? We think about composition, right? What we see when we look at the image, right? There's three people, two women, one man, walking on a public street, the background and foreground on the side are blurred, so we're supposed to be looking at the couple, right? Even the second woman, the woman in the front is blurred. So our focus is supposed to be on the couple. The man and woman are walking and holding hands, and the other woman is walking in front, going the other direction, and has passed them. And the man has twisted to look at the woman who has just passed, and he's pursing his lips, right, in a, in a whistle of appreciation. Um, he's ogling. His partner is looking at him in like shock and horror, right? And at the brazen attention he's giving to the other woman. And the woman in front seems unaware, perhaps. So that's kind of the composition. So we've got what's going on in the figures. Discourses and contexts are embedded in the image. Like what is going on in terms of how the image is circulating ideas? So the first idea is distracted boyfriend, right? It's romantic relationships. And it's saying a few different things about romantic relationships. It's playing on tension between monogamy and cheating, right? In a very gendered way, right? The expectation of monogamy among females, the expectation or a little bit around uh, being looser with that among men. It's forwarding an idea of heteronormativity, right? It's a binary uh, gendered image. And it's playing off very specific gendered stereotypes. It includes ideas of female jealousy and anger and ideas of male hypersexuality, right? Men are just going to look, right? Male visuality even. But it also leverages discourses because of the text around meme production and meme consumption. So one of the ideas there is consumers, in this case of memes, are always looking for newer, better products, right? You get a sort of economic production argument. And then sort of in the implication of the text, which is that the old memes have hurt feelings about the new memes, do memes really get hurt feelings? So there's a, a sort of discourse here of humanizing tech, right? And so when we look at the discourses in that context, we can think about what are our responses and reactions to that? What are our attachments here? So a first response may be humor. And so is that through the relationship frame in the image or the meme production frame? In this case, based on the way this meme is built, does it rely on both frames? There's also irony in this, right? In the meme production frame specifically. Why is the meme author talking about memes in a meme, right? So it's got these layers. And, and we'll see that kind of irony a lot in um, online messaging specifically. It's one of the cultural norms of the web. What else might be a reaction, your reaction, to this type of meme? Well, the specific meme, I should say. Yeah, I was, I was just, uh, I wanted just to clarify. So the question is how we react to this particular meme with <laughs> the um, distracted boyfriend uh, slash uh, old and new memes or in general memes. No, this specific meme. So okay, thank you. No problem. Reactions based on personal emotions. Yep. Yeah. So if a woman is viewing this meme and she has at some point in her lifetime had a boyfriend that tended to look at other women, she might have a particular kind of reaction to this meme generally that could color how she relates to it. Um, but if not, then her reaction might be different, right? So the personal emotions and experiences embed in how we relate to the image itself. We might not find 
old and new memes funny at all. We might be antagonistic to the idea of meme culture. So we might just, ugh, whatever. In some cases, the fact that it's a viral meme for some online cultures will automatically place it into a, it's too normy for me kind of setting. Does that make sense? So in some online internet cultures, the fact that something has spread really far and really wide makes it too normative or too normal, and therefore it's not interesting any longer. So things, memes, even viral ones, have a sell-by date, as it were, right? There's a time when they're just not interesting anymore. Right. So just a quick set of reminders, we're going to move into the hands-on portion where we look at a meme set and talk about it and analyze it together. Um, in this section, we're going to use the speaking and video to kind of see each other and talk things out in rotation. So as we go along, make sure to kind of click in if you want to talk and then click out so someone else can jump into the conversation. All right? So in this practice analysis, we're going to talk about really the first ever viral network harassment campaign, memes that came from that, and that's Gamergate. How many folks on the workshop have heard about Gamergate or know about Gamergate? Okay, so we've got one, two, no, okay. So I will talk a little bit about it for the folks who, who've never heard of, of Gamergate before. So back in 2014, this campaign, it, it went on for several months, online campaign of harassment, started under this hashtag Gamergate. And the campaign was ostensibly, according to the um, people committing the network harassment, about ethics in gaming journalism. So what had happened is a young woman game producer and gamer had created a game um, that a lot of male gamers didn't like. And it got very positive reviews in a gaming magazine. And that made a lot of people very angry. And they started to assert that the reason she had gotten a positive review was because she was sleeping with the person who was doing the reviews. Um, and this started essentially an all-out sort of war online. Um, when people came to her support, other gamers and um, other journalists, they started getting attacked as well. And while it predominantly focused on the gaming um, culture online, it did eventually thread its way through both Manosphere, misogynist cultures online, and um, racist alt-right cultures online. So along with the original game creator, Gamergate Trolls launched attacks against a woman named Anita Sarkeesian, who is also a feminist gamer. She runs the um, blog Feminist Frequency. Um, she had been calling for less sexist um, game development and more equity in gaming, changing costumes on uh, game characters, you name it. And she was also very much hated. So the kind of issues around Gamergate were seen by the people being attacked as anti-feminism um, and misogyny in gaming. So eventually, as I said, this crossed lines between gamers and other um, kind of groups online that have anti-feminist and misogynist sentiments, and we'll look at that a little in the meme set that I'm going to show. Um, and my argument around this is going to be that it circulates between these groups and works specifically through a certain attachment, right, that the people that shared it have. So you'll see there's a lot of images of Sarkeesian in here because she really became a primary target. Um, she still actually receives death threats when she does speaking engagements um, to this day. So let's take a look at some of the images. Just very quickly, I'm going to show the memes one at a time, give you all a couple minutes to kind of look at it, gather thoughts, take notes. Um, if you want to say something about it, feel free to pop into the discussion by selecting your share video, share audio. 
Um, and then just make sure when you're done to click out so someone else can pop in when they want to. Um, and then once we're kind of done going through the memes, we'll talk about the whole thing. So we can talk about the meme set overall. You can um, bring up any kind of other memes or questions or campaigns you want to talk about or talk about earlier parts of the workshop. <clears throat> Oops. Go ahead. So the first meme in the meme set is, as you saw briefly, and I will read the text for you at the bottom because it's a little small. It says, we shall fight in the forums. We shall fight on social media. We shall fight in the advertising streams. We shall defend our hobby, whatever the cost may be. So take a couple of minutes and think about what do you see? What is the intended kind of message or effects? What ideologies you think might be there? What discourses, right? What feelings it brings up? What might be the attachments? I want to make sure everyone has enough time, but I also want to make sure we get to a discussion at the end. So um, I'm going to move on to the next image. If you want me to go back, just ping the chat, and I will go back up to prior image if you need me to. So the second image is this image. <clears throat> Again, think about what is in the image, what ideology is at play, what discourses are leveraged. What are the attachments, the effects? Who might be the maker of this image in relation to the campaign? And let's move into our third image. Uh, this is our first image of Anita Sarkeesian. What is going on here? What is the message? All right. In our next image, we start to see maybe a little bit of a transition. Here we get a two-sided image. The woman on the left is, again, Anita Sarkeesian. The woman on the right, if you don't know who she is, is Lauren Southern, an alt-right YouTuber, uh, an influencer who got very famous. And so we get a little bit of maybe a new discourse into the mix. So sort of continuing on our theme of admixtures a little bit here. We get our next meme. Um, this one is a particularly sort of gendered framing of a very standard anti-Semitic image, um, commonly used in meaning, that is highly problematic. Um, I'm gonna read the text because it's maybe a little difficult to see. It says, but we are not trying to take away our games. And then at the bottom, Censors everything offensive and male default. And I think Deborah also put a comment on the chat. Thank you. Very good reminder. Dictatorship of the politically correct, I think, is exactly part of the discussion here. And, and I think that's really at play in the kind of usage of the Nazi imagery, which I would definitely love to kind of discuss in more detail how that gets used. Excellent. All right, we've got two more images. So the next one is, it says, the March of the SJW. And for folks, if you're not aware, SJW is shorthand for social justice warrior, a common term used by several uh, online groups, including groups from the Manosphere and Far and Alt-Right. Um, the banner around her waist says social justice. Her bullhorn says privilege, privilege, and she is saying misogyny. This is Anita Sarkeesian again. And I think it's important that she's stepping on both a computer and a gavel. So the gavel under her right foot is a very specific symbol here. I think not unrelated to Deborah's uh, comment. And we see that the death of gaming is in the bottom corner. I find uh, this uh, meme analysis very challenging. I, I feel like we have to understand very well the cultural context and different symbols and different layers of the context. So everything, it, it, it looks simple, but it's 
tricky. This is this is my observation. I wanted to sh to share. I think that is an excellent observation. This is definitely true. If you are not or we're not immersed in some of these online cultures, it becomes much more difficult to understand certain aspects of the production. And although I, I would still say there's some broad interconnections. So we have one meme left in the set that I think is pretty interesting. We, we see another move in the meme dis discussion. In this meme, we get a different woman this time. And now we've moved out of the online context or we're trying to move between online and offline contexts. So I know we're going through this at a, a little bit of a clip, but at 740, that'll give us 20 minutes left to just talk together. Um, I wanna go ahead and start just doing open discussion about what we saw, what we think, what discourses are there, how we've analyzed things. Um, I think starting. Hello, Zoran. Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? I can, yes, thank you. Okay. So I think it's pretty clear uh, that it's about uh, self victimization of, of that particular group. They are playing with archetypes, they are going by the book as Nazis did. So, uh, first slide is about positioning them on a positive side using Winston Churchill, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and this call on uh, defend of the kingdom. And then uh, uh, the other things are about, you know, self-victimization of declaring the other side the totalitarian ideology because it will trample their freedom of violence and hate uh, culture and this uh, jewish thing is um, also maybe ascribing uh, identity to someone because in this uh, thing i'm not sure it, if it was relevant or if that uh, woman is a practical jew or it just they, they decoded it from her name her name sounds armenian to me but yeah, I'm not sure. So there are many nasty, <laughs> nasty things in this. Uh, yeah, and the, the chronology of the slides is also really good. Thank you. Yeah, I think you have, have articulated very well a kind of architecture, right? Self-victimization, otherizing the outgroup, portraying them as totalitarians, the sort of the Hitler meme, though, the second meme is a little bit of an outlier because that meme actually comes from um, women responding and trying to position the gamers as uh, as Hitler, right? Um, and it doesn't work very well. So some of that has to do with the volume of people engaged in the networked attack on the Gamergate, pro Gamergate side. There's just a lot more of them, a lot more willing to. Um, participate in the engagement. But over the course, we start to see it change groups. So the as Anita Sarkeesian starts being put into the images, it starts to move from just Gamergate into the kind of MRAs. MRAs really hate Anita Sarkeesian, men's rights activists from the Manosphere. They're strongly anti-feminist, uh, misogynist groups. So as they started to incorporate her, we see it start to move between the Manosphere and then when we get to the Lauren Southern image, it's moved to the alt-right. That's an alt-right discussion. And so I think as uh, Deborah mentioned, we get a new discourse there as well, which is the free speech discourse, the censorship discourse, right? So the feminists don't just wanna take your games, they wanna censor everything, even other women. See, they're not really for women's liberation. It's sort of the alt-right discussion. So they were able to plug into Gamergate through that narrative. And then we see the continuation of anti-Semitic images, right, with the the Jewish portrayal, the cartoon, which takes it fully into the kind of white supremacist, white nationalist frame. And then it sort of comes back out and goes into a more normative politic, right? We get the cartoon, the SJW cartoon, which is from a radical right sort of kind of frame. And it moves into politics with the last meme with Hillary Clinton. So it's a really interesting 
structure the way that worked over a few years. Um, but what are other thoughts people had about what they saw? Feel free to kind of click on your. Okay. Got stuff in the chat. Please feel free to click into the talk and video. Um, two main things. Feeling the position is the right one. Oops, my chat's moving too fast. Um, gives the right to hate speech to the idea that women are crazy. They cry over nothing. Excellent. It's pulling on gendered stereotypes. That is absolutely part of this, right? It's a meme set made for men, a discussion between men. men. The memes actually admit that gaming is based on misogyny and social injustice, and there's no fun in games that are not abusive. Excellent. I, I think that to a certain point that is right, right? The pleasure is in the misogyny and in the anti-feminism. Huge problem with red pills in Italy. So, Deborah, like, yes, the red pill ideology is in there. The red pill discourse is in there. If you are aware of it, you can see it. If you're not, I don't think it takes away from the memes, right? So it can act as a way to get people into red pill ideology as well, potentially. But engage more that men should be more engaged to raise their advocacy and counteract with other guys, right? So we, we could think about how might posi positive messaging or how might messaging around masculinities that aren't sort of violent and aggressive or misogynist might work. Fernanda, why don't you think you got the exercise? And activists ruining the fun, right? Those, so um, there is a term called um, feminist killjoy. I don't know if anyone has read any Sarah Ahmed that's a little grad schoolish, but this is something that Ahmed talks about, right? That she's the feminist killjoy, that we're, by telling the truth, by being activists for what's real right we're ruining everyone's fun um and that she she proudly takes up that that mantle um but it is a real issue this idea that um articulating problems in society makes the person articulating them the bad guy so i got a lot more of it because i've been studying these memes for seven years right so an initial analysis of a campaign is not going to be so detailed um and i watched that campaign happen in real time um, it helps me to kind of show you the arc, my knowledge of that. But when you're looking at campaigns for your messaging and analyzing them for your building other campaigns, um, you'll be spending time with things that you're more connected to, that are more connected to the topics of your concern. And that'll make it easier for you to analyze discourses. They'll also likely be things that are more local to your context. Um, so, there isn't an expectation that you would see everything in the meme set that I saw. What I'm seeing in the chat and our discussion so far is you're doing really, really well. Um, this type of analysis takes practice and it takes engaging with campaigns over time. I see Fernanda, um, um, Fernanda remark, and I have maybe, I hope not completely off topic question, but how what would you recommend to non-governmental organizations or activists how to use memes so first of all if you're doing youth campaigns work with the youth because they understand in a native way that older people do not what is effective and what is not right so it can be very hard to build a meme um, around a message precisely because often the reason things go viral is that they've been co-opted. So in this case, we could think about like PayPay -Pay culture. PayPay -Pay was famous before, it wasn't quite as virally famous before the alt-right took it over, but it, the fact of co-opting that meme is what made it go really viral. So looking at memes that the youth think are important and starting from there, in the campaigns is important. Um, you may want to actually, whether you decide to use memes that you produce in your campaign, memes are a way for you to understand where the discourses are in the topic you're looking at. 
So I would say if you're looking at um, kind of inclusive messaging around something like um, queerness, you would want to see how what memes are being spread locally in your communities that share kind of negative messaging, what are potentially being shared that have positive messaging, and then decide where your message needs to be to kind of push back at those things and what does that look like, right? So you might want to, instead of building your own meme, find memes that agree with your sort of tenor of your organization and support those, if that makes more sense. Um, I'm not sure if it does, but already extant memes are going to have a little more leg power than things you create typically on your own. Uh, thank you. Exactly. I, I this, uh, thank you for 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 answering this question. And I was also thinking, where do you go to find memes? Where do I go to find memes? So I I often will just simply Google a topic, and then do an, then click images, and scroll. If I just want to see generally what's made it to Google, right? If you're focusing on specific platforms like Twitter and things like that. You can do hashtag searches in Twitter and then scroll through feeds to see what's there. Um, if you want to research a meme and see what its history is, there's a great website called Know Your Meme um, that will tell you the history of how a meme has been used and where it's been, um, which is which can sometimes be really useful to kind of understanding what's going on. It'll give you the context for the meme. Um, but most people like pull these things based on what they're seeing on social media. So if you're focused on an Instagram campaign, you want to search for memes using a topic or a hashtag on Instagram to see what's being shared in that context. If you're focused on Twitter or you're focused on Facebook, you want to see what's being shown on Facebook. And if you're generally looking to see how prevalent something is in, in popular culture in your area, a major search engine like, like a Google or whatever is popular in your locale is going to give you what's made it to the mainstream, if that makes sense. And that's just doing searching by the topic or a hashtag and clicking over to image in the results. Perfect, Noemi. Thank you for putting the link in. Do we have any other kind of questions? Are there other topics that folks are interested in or focus on right now that they'd like to talk about? Got eight minutes. We can do it. So while we wait to see if anything pops up for anyone, um, when you're looking at the meme set, and this will be recorded so you can kind of go back through it. Oh, you got someone for Nina. Thank you. Navigating content. Sure, I can work with Noemi to, to get some things together for, for you all. Um, I think at some point we were going to do some sort of kind of quick tip or handout sheet. Um, the video will be posted so you can go through the video kind of again, but I will make sure she can get something out to people. So I know this was like a lot of content, a lot to cover, a lot of new ideas. Um, and I really appreciate everyone going down that rabbit hole with me. Do I think youth sometimes do not understand the context of memes they share? If so, can I say a word about that and the effects of it? So I think not just youth, but everyone um, falls into that. Sometimes we have uh, sort of a quick trigger finger on sharing because something connects to us in an impactful way um, and we don't understand the context. In fact, one of the arguments I make about how um, extremism circulates through, especially through meme culture, is, is that it's a partial anonymous, in some ways, participation. You don't have to be an extremist to share something that you found funny that happens to be laden with extremism. Right. You just don't have to like if you don't understand it, you wouldn't necessarily know. So I think part of the reason one of the threads in this set of memes and one of the things that I think circulates sort of racial and anti-Semitic hate as a primary factor is misogyny. Um, it's a very useful narrative because it's much easier to kind of walk up to someone in online culture and be like, you know, women are just out to get men. Those feminists are horrible, the feminazi kind of backlash, than it is to say you should hate Jews or you should hate black people, right? So 
youth or people on the fringes who don't necessarily get deeply involved in these contexts will share their media. And that does provide wider circulation and wider engagement. And it's important because we share things typically in associational groups. So if I get something from someone I trust or someone I have a relationship with that I like, I'm more likely to listen to what they're sharing or pay attention to what they're sharing than I am if it's just generally in the media around me. So it can have um, pretty intensive effects on changing the discourse. Um, I would say Gamergate changed the Overton window in a lot of ways on what was acceptable misogynist speech online. It had been bad before, but it got way worse afterward. Um, and we saw the effects of some of those things in the 2016 election, certainly in the US. A lot of the narratives I had been seeing online from 2014, 2015 um, were prevalent in our politics and our regular everyday on TV politics. So it does have impacts when people share things where they don't understand the full context or weight of what's in the meme, I think. I would argue. Thank you all for going on this workshop journey with me. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you diving into a bunch of images that are from my context. Yes. I'd also like to say my info is on the expo page. So if you want to connect with me or talk to me on Twitter or website or anything like that, all my information is in the expo if you need it.